All right, this morning, let's go ahead and open our Bibles to Revelation, and we're uh, making our way through the book of Revelation, and we've, we've, we've slowed down a bit because we're in this uh, significant uh, section. The first, two, uh, first three chapters uh, are different from the rest of the book. Chapter one uh, gives us the actual setting of, of John's vision that he has, and then chapters two and three are uh, seven messages from Jesus directly to seven historical churches, churches that were in existence at the time in real cities. It's, this is not allegorical. You don't have to you know, spiritualize any of this. These were real people in real cities undergoing uh, real circumstances, and Jesus has something to say to each of the seven churches. There were more than seven churches in the area, so we, we believe that these seven were chosen on purpose. Um, some people see in the, the seven churches actually sort of a, a picture of church history, um, which I think is interesting and, and possibly true, but uh, I think that definitely because each one of these letters or messages to each of the seven churches ends with the exhortation, if you have ears to hear, then hear what the Spirit says to the church. So definitely these seven churches all uh, the, their condition, Jesus' diagnosis of their condition, and his, his prescribed treatment is meant to be instructive for every age of believers. So uh, I said this when we first started this um, study a few weeks ago, uh, that you might find yourself being all seven churches on any particular day. So this isn't, you know, you're going to look at this and say, well, early in the morning I was lukewarm, then I, then I left my first love, then I was compromised, then I was tempted, and then uh, I was fighting off bad doctrine, and then I was suffering. And that was before lunch. Uh, so you, you'll, you'll see yourself, and it, you're, it, these are written so that we would see ourselves. They're, they're, um, they're instructive for the church to try to help us, because in general, these are things that, that churches will be dealing with throughout church history. So... We'll pick up in verse 18, we're, we're going to look at uh, a different church for each study, so this morning it's uh, Thyatira, tonight we'll be in chapter 3, the first part, uh, the church at Sardis, and then you're reading for next week, Re just keep reading these chapters and we'll get into uh, Philadelphia and Laodicea next week. So verse 18 of chapter 2, to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Each one of these letters uh, follows a certain pattern, and this one follows that pattern where the church is named, and then there's a description of Jesus that reminds us from chapter 1 that John was actually seeing a vision. This book is called The Revelation of Jesus Christ, and it actually begins with a revelation of Jesus Christ. John is in exile. He's on an island called Patmos, a real island. It's in the Mediterranean uh, John was in exile, therefore he said the testimony of Jesus for the word of God. Uh, church history adds some detail about him being put in exile there. Uh, the Romans had taken him and during one of their great persecutions, and he had been boiled in oil and somehow survived that, and so they gouged his eyes out, and then they put him in exile on the island of Patmos. So John is, is an older man. All the other apostles have, have suffered uh, death for, for their preaching the gospel. John's the last one alive. He himself probably should have died, but they couldn't kill him, so God had kept him alive. Now he's in exile on this little island, and he has a revelation of Jesus. He actually sees Jesus, and he sees a glorified Jesus. John is the one who calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's the one who was leaning on Jesus at the Last Supper. He's a very close friend with Jesus. He knows Jesus very well, but when he sees Jesus in chapter 1, at the end of his description of Jesus, he says, I fell at his feet like a dead person. He's seeing Jesus in a manifested glory that overwhelms him. So the description in chapter 1 is uh, someone who's glorious and radiant in their countenance like the sun shining in its strength. Now today outside, it was raining on you when you came in. There's cloudy. We're, we're in the Sacramento Valley we know that we're in winter, we're probably going to see the sun a few days uh, before May, right? I mean, you know, it's, we're into that season where we don't see the sun. Well, when it's a hot, sunny day and you think of the summertime, and you try to look at the sun, you can't. 
It's too, you shouldn't, don't, don't do it. You'll burn your eyes. When we have an eclipse, we always have to warn everybody, don't look at the sun, don't try to see the eclipse because trying to look at the eclipse with your naked eye is going to eclipse your eye. <laughs> the, only, the only eclipse you're going to have is a burn mark on your retina. So uh, the sun shining in its strength is something so glorious that you can look, but then you have to look away. It's just too much. And that's who Jesus was. That's who he is. That's what John was seeing and then he describes him, feet like brass burning in a furnace, just radiating this, this, uh, this, the glorious color of brass. And then eyes like a flame of fire. He's got a white garment and, and, a, and a golden belt around his chest and hair white like wool, a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And John says, I was overwhelmed and I fell at his feet and Jesus had to lift me up and, and tell me not to be afraid and, and introduce himself to me as as, as the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the, the alive from the dead. And then these messages. And so each one of these seven letters begins by reminding us of some attribute or some part of the picture that John saw from chapter 1. So, verse 18, we're reminded that these things says the Son of God, eyes like a flame of fire and feet like fine brass. So that sort of lets you know how this letter is going to turn out. I, didn't, I wanted to stop here and not read the whole thing so that you could just sort of imagine. Um, what do you, how do you think it's going to go when he says, my eyes are like a flame of fire? Uh, imagine if you were talking to your friend, hey, how's your marriage going? I don't know, but the other day my wife sure had eyes like a flame of fire. You're going to say, oh, not that good then, huh? Maybe, <laughs> I mean, eyes like a flame of fire is generally not good. Yeah, the cop pulled me over and boy, he had eyes like a flame of fire. Ew. Uh, the IRS agent showed up at my house, eyes like a flame of fire. I mean, you just put it in any context. It's probably not good. I, I, I told my teacher, and she had eyes like a flame of fire. Not good. Eyes like a flame of fire, feet like fine brass. In, in the Bible, brass used as, a, as, a, as an instrument of worship, or a brass is repeatedly used as an instrument of worship, and always associated with judgment, always associated with the taking away of sin. We have the, the bronze labor where the priests would wash. We have the instruments of brass that are used in the tabernacle and later in the temple for, for the, the sacrifice. They're part of the judgment of God on sin and the taking away of sin. And so Jesus, with feet burning, that, I mean, they look like brass burning in the furnace. And, in this, and the idea of eyes like a flame of fire that he sees, that he sees through, that that he's righteous, that there's judgment, that there's cleansing, that there's purging. Um, this is significant. Um, and I think that this is important for us, uh, in, in particular for them, and we'll make the point as it relates to what his message is to them, but I think for us in general, it's important for us to remember that Jesus sees and that his judgment is just. That when Jesus looks, he sees everything perfectly. Now you can come to church and and you, you, know, you get ready, you look nice, you come in, you see your friend, like, hey, how's it going? Oh, it's going great. It may not be going great, but you tell them it's going great. Uh, you say, what's happening? Oh, it's pretty good. I'm going to a little trial. And you smile. And it's a terrible trial. I mean, it's a tr you should be weeping. But we sort of we present ourselves a certain way. And so you see a person, and, and then you even hear later, you're like, oh, I heard so-and-so. Like, I saw them. They seem fine. Because we can fool each other, right? You, I can fool you, and you can fool me. We did it this morning already, right? You guys look fine. But I know some of you aren't, you know? I look fine. Am I? I you know? I mean, we can present ourselves a certain way. You know who sees everything? Jesus. Now, for some people, that might be frightening. For those of us who know him, we think, oh, thank God. <laughs> thank God that when you tell Jesus, I'm fine, he goes, yeah, I know better than that. My eyes, look, they're like a flame of fire. I see right through everything that you're saying, everything you're presenting. Isn't it wonderful to think that when you talk to the Lord, you're never informing him of anything? Our prayers are never informative, even though sometimes the words we use will sound like we're informing the Lord. Lord, I just want to talk to you about my friend. They were in this terrible car accident. Oh, really? Oh, my goodness. Thanks for letting me know. I, I didn't realize. Now, we inform each other because we don't have eyes like a flame of fire. But you don't have to inform Jesus about anything. In fact, it might be the other way around. You might start praying and he might start informing, Lord, just you need to deal with this person. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, I think you need to actually deal with me. 
Have you been, have, has Jesus been informing you what your attitude was once you started to pray about something else and then you realized, oh my goodness, I think I'm the one that has a problem. I'm the one that is out of order. The eyes like a flame of fire is wonderful. Wonderful that his judgment is just, that he sees. And I think it's important to emphasize this. You might say, well, Rich, this is basic. We already know this. It's important for us to be reminded of this because we live in a, in a time of great corruption. Uh, it might be hard to imagine that there's just judgment in a time of great corruption. Uh, I think that uh, in our country currently, there seems to be uh, a cry, uh, and not just from one part of the culture to another, but from several parts uh, in, within our nation, for a, a cry for a deliverance from corruption. Uh, a, cr- a voice that's crying out saying, I don't want to be treated uh, in a way by someone in power in a, in a way that's disrespectful. I don't want to be treated in a way because of the color of my skin. I don't want to... I mean, there's, there's, there's the acknowledging that in our nation and in our, in our culture, there's corruption. And we're not sure that the political leaders are going to do what needs to be done to deal with the corruption. We're not sure that the business leaders are going to be responsible enough and act in, in the interest of people and not just be, be driven by the bottom line, the corporations driven by shareholder interest. Right? Like, what's in the best interest? I mean, to, to think of a statesman or to think of a politician. And, and so we live in a place where corruption, we sort of can get the idea like, it's just going to be like this. Um, it's, it's important to remember there is somebody who's a just judge, whose eyes are like a flame of fire, who really will be judging and we'll be judging in a righteous way. And at some point, there will be an end of all corruption. I think as Americans, we're concerned about our country. But you know, if you think worldwide, some of you that pay attention to news around the world, how, how, how encouraged do you think the people are in Zimbabwe that with the end of Mugabe's reign of terror and corruption in that nation, do you, how many people do you think really have a legitimate hope that it's going to get better? I mean... Uh, there's always already been a power play where he tried to put his wife uh, in charge and the army stepped in and they took over the country. Have you been reading about it? A whole nation full of people. Do you think that they have, a, I mean, what's their legitimate chance that they'll deal with corruption in their nation or that their next form of leadership is going to be just as bad as the one as before it? Uh, I think as much as we have problems in our country, you know uh, what will encourage you about our country? A visit to a different country. Because, you know, we have some issues. Go live in China for a while. Why don't you go live in Cambodia for a while? Go spend some time in sub-Sahara, West Africa. Go, go live in Saudi Arabia and practice your free speech. I mean, uh, take your Bible. Well, they won't let you take your Bible. I mean, think of all the different places in the world where all the people who live there are living with the reality corruption is a way of life. And for most people... Their dealing with corruption is to try to figure out the system, to avoid it, to try to survive it and go, I'm going to dodge this person, dodge that person, say yes, sir, here, avoid that, and just try to get my way forward and, you know, limit the damage. I mean, that's kind of how it is everywhere in the world. What's so encouraging about this, we have to remind ourselves, Jesus has eyes like a flame of fire. And he's the one whose feet, where he's standing, he stands in perfect judgment, he can see perfectly, And one day, all corruption is going to be gone. One day, he'll reign. And the kingdom that he's established will not have corruption. Isn't that amazing to think about? All lying will be done with. The devil's going into a lake of fire. I mean, you can read the whole book of Revelation. This is a revelation of Jesus. What we see revealed about him in chapter 1, we see the realities of that because of his identity. We see it worked out in human history where there's a new heavens and a new earth, and it's righteousness. He's the light of the place. Everything that makes a lie is gone. The devil is in a lake of fire. The Antichrist is in a lake of fire. Uh, the, the judgment has happened, and there's a righteous place. There's a home for us. That's, a, that's true. Don't let the corruption of this generation cause you to lose hope on a, on, a, on a victory by Jesus. There will be a release from all corruption. I want to remind you, though, as we're thinking about this, this is not written to um, Trump. Verse 18, it's to the angel of the church of Thyatira. It's not written to the Republican Party or the Democrats or the People's Republic 
or some other entity or to the UN. It's written actually to the pastor of a church. So if you're the pastor of a church and you get a letter from Jesus that says, hey, I want to write you a letter. My eyes are like a flame of fire. Oh, what do we do? <laughs> so uh, I want to remind you of a great principle. Turn to 1 Peter. We won't spend a lot of time on this, but I want you to see it with your own eyes. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin. Now don't say amen. Don't say amen because look what it says. It's time for judgment to begin at the house of God. So be careful with your amens. Bring the judgment, Lord. Where does the judgment start? Jesus is going to cleanse his church. Jesus' ministry in our lives leads to the removal of corruption from our lives. Judgment begins, and judgment begins at the house of God. And this church that he's writing this letter to, he starts off by saying, this is the one speaking, the one with the eyes like a flame of fire, whose feet are like the brass burning in the furnace. He's got something he wants to say, and it's because he's going to, he wants to bring a cleansing to the church. Judgment can be thought of as judgment, and for some, if the heart is hard and you don't want to hear what God has to say, it's going to, it's going to be hard. If your heart is hard, judgment's hard. But you know what? If your heart's open, judgment, you could use another word for judgment. It's called cleansing. <laughs> Aren't you glad that God looks at you and says, I'm not leaving you that way? And you say, oh, please, Lord, don't leave me this way. Lord, I don't want to be like this. Oh, God, change me. Change my heart. Take your rightful place on the throne of my life. Some would see judgment as being a negative thing, but for those who know Jesus, they say, Lord, look at me with your eyes of fire. Come and take up residence in my heart and drive out all the corruption. Lord, let my heart be a place where you're at home. Judgment begins with the house of God. And if it begins with us first, he, Peter goes on, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So we remember that judgment is related to us, but it's a judgment because of the death of Jesus on the cross, his resurrection from the dead. It's, it's an it's a honesty, it's a truthfulness related to our true condition. Jesus sees it, he's honest about it, and he deals with it. Uh, Jesus didn't die on the cross so you have a get-out-of-jail-free card so you can keep living in sin. Where, oh yeah, hey, what are you doing? Oh man, I'm a Christian. That's what I'm doing. No, 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 no. You gave your life to Jesus. You let him come into your heart. Let him drive that junk out of your heart. Not, not I accepted the Lord. That's how I can keep doing this. That, that's a false uh, view of Christianity. And that's what's kind of going on in this church uh, that we're looking at in Revelation chapter 2. So, Go back to chapter 2. In verse 19, there's uh, much that they can be commended for. He says, I know your works and your love, your service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. So this is a church that um, has a lot going on. This is quite a list. These are all things we'd want to have in our lives. Works and love and service and faith and patience. And that they're expanding. He said, what you're doing now is better than what you did before. Uh, there's a, there's a, a growth in the extent of your ministry, a growth in the impact of your ministry. You used to, you used to be able to operate like this, but now you've, you've increased, and that, that's all good. It's great. The problem is there's a corruption that has uh, been introduced to them. Uh, and before we get into that, I wanted to kind of juxtapose this church with the first church we looked at at the beginning of chapter 2, the church at Ephesus. Remember what their issue was? They, they were checking out false teachers and finding them to be false. So they were, they were careful about their doctrine, but they had left their first love. This church has love, but they're not careful about the doctrine. It's almost like if you put them next to each other, like these, these guys have they have a concern for the false teaching and they're dealing with it, but they left their love. These guys have this love and works that are growing and their love is growing, but they haven't been checking the doctrine. And, and this is a great place to remind ourselves that we're not, we're not going to take any one of these and, and uh, hold it up as the ideal above the others. Um, and, I, and I purposely said, you might be all seven churches on any particular day. I didn't say that just to be funny or to encourage you, because maybe you think, I think I have been all seven of these on one day. 
but to remind us that God's doing a work in our lives and we have to be aware of all those things that are important to him. Is first love important? Yeah. So we want to make sure we keep it. Uh, do we want to make sure that in our suffering we keep our eyes on Jesus? Yeah, that's important too. Do we need to, do we need to make sure that we don't allow for false and weird teachings to creep in? Yeah, that too. So it's, it's sort of a balanced picture, not any one of these is the definitive only word to the church. That's why I think there's all seven. So um, having said that, let's now dig into what the issue is that Jesus is concerned about. Verse 20, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So two main issues. One has to do with... Uh, the sexual mores the, that the, this person uh, who's called Jezebel by Jesus is, is introducing the idea that it really doesn't matter uh, that you follow what God's word says about sex. You can just kind of do whatever you want. And also idolatry, that it's okay to participate in idolatry. So verse 21, Jesus says, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she didn't repent. So even though uh, this was happening in the church, there was space that was given for repentance to take place, but um, she wouldn't repent. And then this warning of judgment, verse 22, indeed I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. And then even stronger warning in verse 23, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your works. One of the mistakes that sometimes people make related to sin and us allowing sin to be part of our lives is we're doing something we know God says not to do, but everything didn't go wrong. You know, we didn't get struck by lightning. The, you know, the economy didn't crash. We didn't get fired from our job. The car didn't blow up or whatever. You know, because there was space to repent, then sometimes people fall into the wrong idea that, like, well, God doesn't care, or it doesn't matter if you repent, that you can just continue on in a lifestyle. Well, Jesus makes it really clear. The fact that you didn't get judged doesn't mean there's not judgment. It just means I was giving you space so that you would repent. But she didn't repent, and if she doesn't repent, then she's going to be judged severely, and those who participate with her in what she's saying and are influenced by her in the congregation they're going to be judged severely. In fact, uh, kind of in the strongest terms possible, he's going to kill them. <laughs> They're going to be thrown into a sickbed and then die, and that, and that there's a judgment coming, so there's this warning. Now, why does Jesus speak so strongly about that? Well, I think it has to do with uh, what she's teaching them. Now, look back at verse 20. Her, it's, she's called Jezebel. So, Apparently in the church, there's this woman, and she's influencing the congregation with her teaching about, um, about the antiquity. The Bible's an old-fashioned book, and it's got old-fashioned values, and we're a newfangled relation. You know, this is, a, this is the first century, and we've got all these new things, and nobody before us knew what we know, and so it doesn't really matter what you do. Just, do, you, do you, are you hurting anybody? Are you consenting, adults? You know, if it makes you happy, then you should do it. You know, she's, she's promoting a teaching, and it's influencing the church, and Jesus calls her Jezebel. Now, I don't know that her name is really Jezebel. I think that would be a giveaway, all right? Uh, if you're hearing your name is Jezebel, I'm sorry, we love you. Um, we won't judge you, okay? But I think probably Jesus is using that name to remind us that what she's doing and what she's saying has happened before. This isn't anything new. The idea that, that, that somebody would, would become part of what God's doing and bring in a message, well, this is old. This isn't anything that's new. And so do you guys remember Jezebel? Do you remember her in the Old Testament? I want to go back. Let's look at her, and then we'll compare her to what uh, this, je this woman's saying. So turn back to 1 Kings in your Bible. 1 Kings... And we'll, we'll see her first introduced in chapter 16 in the summary statement. Uh, first Kings will focus on the details of some aspects of the different kings and their reign, and then they'll have sections that are sort of summary statements. And we get a summary statement 
And she's introduced in this summary statement at the end of chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16, and we'll start in verse 29. In the 38th year of Asa, the king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. So you, you saw two different nations mentioned, Judah and Israel. It's the same nation. They had a civil war. They separated, and the northern kingdom was called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. And they had different kings. The sons of David reigned in the south. And in the north, there was a series of violent political coups and uh, t- terrible treachery. And so several different families reigned in the north. And this is, this is a time period where Asa was in the south. Ahab is in the north. So that's a summary statement. Verse 29 says, going on, Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria for 22 years. Now, verse 30, Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. So this guy has surpassed everybody. What he's put into policy is worse than anybody before him. Verse 31, here's kind of how it happened. It came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. The sins of Jeroboam are a reference, you remember, to idolatry. Jeroboam, when the kingdom separated north and south, Jeroboam's sin was to introduce idolatry. So he was concerned that the people in the north would travel to the south on the holidays uh, and they would, uh, their allegiance would go back to the, king of, the son of David, the king of Judah, and they'd go back to Jerusalem to worship. So this guy, as a political expediency, set up a golden calf in the far north and a golden calf in the south and said, you don't need to go to Jerusalem. These are your gods. You can worship here. The sins of Jeroboam is idolatry. So Ahab's participating in that, so there's idolatry. And then we have this statement. He took as wife Jezebel, and notice where she's from, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. She's not Jewish. She's not an Israeli. She's an unbeliever. She, she's an idolatrous woman. She's a princess from a pagan kingdom. Her father's named after a false god. She, ha, she is a person who joins into Israel, but she's not a follower of God. She's an idol worshiper. She's pagan. But now she's the queen of Israel. Um, oh, my goodness. So through her influence, we know the story of, of their reign. They were very wicked. They actually hired hundreds of false prophets to spread their doctrine throughout their nation Uh, personally, she supported hundreds of false prophets and and spread uh, the sexual immorality and idolatry through the country. But she herself wasn't a believer. She wasn't Jewish. She she wasn't descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In in Ahab's corruption, he brought her in. And, And so that's sort of this summary statement. And they were notorious for sexual immorality. That was kind of Uh, what marked them. Now, there's one story that makes us a little bit more general, and I want you to turn to chapter 21 of 1 Kings, because I think this will help us, because I think uh, Jesus references specifically sexual immorality, so we want to make that point, but he also references idolatry. And there's a particular story in um, Ahab and Jezebel's life and their relationship with each other which I think in a broader way will help us to recognize her influence. It's in chapter 21, verse 1 of 1 Kings chapter 21. It came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, now he's introduced to us here, we don't know anything about him except for this. He had a vineyard that was in Jezreel and it was next to the palace of Ahab, the king of Samaria. So we're introduced to this character What we know about him is he's next door neighbors with Ahab and Jezebel. Verse 2, Ahab spoke to Naboth saying, give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it's near next to my house and I'll give you a vineyard better than it or if it seems good to you, I'll give you its worth in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance or give the inheritance of my fathers to you. That's a reference to, this is, this is part of the allotment of land that when Joshua came into the land and they divided up the land, like generations have gone by, this is the land that God gave us. Like 
I can't give this land up. This is family land. It's not land that I earned or bought from somebody else. No, I won't give you the land. Now look at verse 4. Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. He laid down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. Yes, this is really in the Bible, and yes, it's happening. Verse 5, Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth, the general line, and I said, Give me your vineyard. Is this real? Is this, this is in the Bible, okay? Give me the vineyard for money, or if it pleases you, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I won't give you my vineyard. Does this sound like anybody you know? Sounds like me. Jezebel's wife said, verse 7, and I want you to see her influence and watch her, listen to her message. You now exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat food, and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Now, there's treachery involved. I won't go into the whole story. You, you know the story. You can read it. If you have never read it, read the rest of it. It's a terrible story. And because of the wickedness of this story, actually her judgment is pronounced because of this event, and the way she'll die is directly connected to this event. In spite of the fact they introduced idolatry to the land and all the sexual immorality and all the corruption nationally that they were responsible for, this event was unique. It's chronicled for us, the wickedness of it, and it's about a vegetable garden and, and she has this guy killed, and they transfer the asset, and the, her husband gets it. And I want you to think about her wisdom there and what she says. Here's a guy, and he says, I don't like how my life is. And her answer is, your life should be however you want it is, however you want it to be. You just please yourself. You see, if you take what Jezebel would say, you can apply it very generally now, you, you may be here and sexual immorality is an issue for you. Maybe you're living in sexual sin and you're saying, well, God, it's okay, we're in love, or it's okay, you know, God knows what I've been through and so this is fine and I talked to him about it. He said, it's okay. It's not. It's wrong. Uh, it's God's will for you to be sanctified and to live a holy life. God created us to experience the pleasures of a man and a woman coming together as one, but within the confines of marriage. God describes it. He gives specific instruction about it. I mean, that's what God's Word says. You can agree with it or disagree with it, but that's what God's Word says. And she's come along in this church in Revelation. Jesus reminds us of this story, and she says, it, no, no, you can just please yourself. You please yourself, and if you're pleased, that's fine. Isn't that what she's saying here? She's telling Ahab, it's most important that you make yourself happy, and I'll help make you happy. That's, that's that message of Jezebel. Doesn't it sound familiar? Yeah. It sounds like Genesis chapter 3. It sounds like the devil telling Eve, what matters is that you're happy. What matters is that you get what you want. What matters is that you have your life go the way you want it to go. And don't really worry about what God said or God's timing or God's plan. You just don't worry about it. I'll take care of it for you. You can make yourself happy. You should never be sad. Now, listen. I don't want anybody to be sad. But didn't Jesus say, in the world you'll have tribulation? <laughs> and he told us how to be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We find our peace in Jesus. We don't find it in the world. We find our joy where? We rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Do you have to win the lottery to have that kind of joy? No, no, you get it from Jesus. Where do you, where do you get a river of living water that flows out of you like a torrent? You get that when you believe in Jesus. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being would flow a river of living water. You see, Jesus taught us to turn away from this kind of thinking and to turn towards him and follow him. But, but kind of, I think this more general story that, that uh, is significant in that, you know, the, the judgment on her is where the dogs, you know, where you killed this guy, the dogs are going to lick your blood. And that's exactly what happened. If you, you know, you can read it later. Uh, Jehu comes and runs her over with the chariot and then puts it in reverse. Beep, beep, beep. You know, and backs up over a few times and then goes in and has, has something to eat and then thinks, oh, we should go bury her. And they went back and what did they find? The dogs had already eaten her. I mean, it's gross. Okay? It's, it, but it's directly connected to this story. 
Her judgment was directly related to this wickedness. And this wickedness is about a vegetable garden. It's about neighbors having a fight, a conflict. Well, do we just have a shooting in Northern California? A couple weeks ago, I think I was in Israel, and there was a shooting in Northern California. And what was it? Who was fighting? Isn't it neighbor? It's neighbors, right? And a guy goes on a shooting. I mean, like, the Bible's not new. <laughs> the Bible's old, and what we're doing is not new. Our interest in sexual immorality is not new. It's been explored. We're not the first culture that said, you know what, let's just do whatever we want. There have been many cultures that have done that. What happened to them? They destroyed themselves. It's been played out over and over. It's an experiment that's been done. And in our culture, where we're throwing off the, the shackles, if you will, the, the, what the Bible says about gender identity or sex or the place of sex in the life of a person, and we start to listen to the teaching of Jezebel that says, just please yourself, do what you want, make yourself happy, we're going to have the same result. The sad thing is this church that we're looking at in Revelation 2, let's go back there, this church is being influenced by this teaching. You allow it, verse 20 says, you allow this person, she calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. You can have whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. What you feel is what's most important. How you feel is reality. The Bible is really clear. God invented sex. God, in the very initial act of creation, when he created man and woman, he created them male and female, the Bible says. Your physical gender is a gift to you from God. It's not something that you get to decide uh, according to your own uh, lust, what you, what you feel like. Now, is that popular in our culture? No. If, if, if you say what I just said at your job, if you work for the state and you say what I just said, you're going to get fired. You're not allowed to say that. I might, we may not allow, be allowed to exist as a church with a, with a recognition from the state by believing what the Bible, and in a very short time. But, but listen, this is something worth telling people. Because God's word says it, okay? Your gender is not subject to your emotions. Your gender is given to you by God. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. You don't follow Jesus according to like this Jezebel in our passage that Jesus is warning about. Her message to the church is, you follow Jesus by pleasing yourself. Jesus wants you happy. He came that you'd have life and have it more abundantly. So he wants you happy. And if you, this makes you happy, you should do it. And if this makes you happy, you should do that. You should be, who, who are we to put some archaic requirement from some ancient civilization on people? And she's, she's saying it in the first century. But Jezebel said it, what, some thousand plus years or several hundred years earlier, probably eight, 800, 900 years earlier. Uh, but but the devil said that in the garden to Eve. <laughs> God's trying to rip you off. You eat the fruit. You're going to be like God. God God's not, he doesn't have your best interests in mind. This voice is the same voice that we've heard all along. The, the challenge for this church in Thyatira is the pressure of their culture, a Im sexually immoral culture, completely confused about the purpose and the place of sex, and, and just expressing yourself in every way possible, it's putting pressure on the congregation and someone's gotten themselves in the congregation and they're telling the believers, just do whatever you want. And that, that's a lie from the pit of hell. If you do whatever you want, you're going to mess yourself up. You that are parents, was that ever a good counsel for your kids? You look at them about three or four years old, you go, you know what? You've got a free will. You should just decide, do whatever you want. You never told your kids that. You said, you share with your brother. I don't want to. Well, you share. I don't want to. I want his vineyard. Ahab, that dude needed a spanking. Uh, and he needed a mom and dad to restrain him, to teach him right and wrong, to teach him, listen, man, that's not... But instead he had a Jezebel who told him, you just do what you want to make you happy. I'll take care of it. I'll make you happy. It's a lie. And Jesus didn't immediately judge this person in Revelation chapter 2. Look at verse 21 again. I gave her time to repent. There's a space. There's, there's a gap. He could have judged her. He could have just come in and... Poof. She could have said, hey, this is what you guys need to do. And boom, she dropped over dead. Whoa. 
I think that's a false teaching. She's dead. But no. Why, why was there space to repent? Because he loves her. It's not God's desire that any should perish, but all come to repentance. And there's space to repent, and he gave her space to repent, and now there's a warning. Listen, if you don't repent, there's going to be a judgment. The judgment begins with the house of God. Now, the answer for all of this is, is to repent. Look at verse 24. This isn't the whole church. This is just part of the church. Verse 24, Jesus said, I say to you and to the rest in Thyatira, notice, as many as do not have this doctrine. So you've got a congregation. Part of the congregation is living in sexual immorality, and they think it's okay. Part of the congregation is living a completely self-centered life and saying, well, that's fine. That's what it is to be a Christian. I, I just do what I want. Christianity is about me being happy. And uh, they've embraced this. And the other part of the congregation is trying to deny itself and take up its cross and follow Jesus. Is that true? Is that happening in America? Is that our church this morning? Did there be in an assembly on a Sunday morning in America some people who are living in sexual sin and if you confronted them, they would say, this isn't sexual sin. Well, wait, are you married? No. Are you involved? Yeah. How is that not sexual sin? Didn't God create marriage? Isn't, isn't, isn't the intention of God for a man and a woman to come together and become one? God has a plan for this. God has a wonderful plan for it. And it's designed by God so that there would be intimacy, so that he says they will, become, they will come together, they will be one. The two will be one flesh. It's a supernatural miracle of God. Two individuals become one. That doesn't happen when you're having sexual immorality. Sexual immorality is about the physical pleasures, and there's a corruption and a breaking of this intimacy that God had intended. The Hebrew word that God uses when Adam, what does it say about his wife? Adam knew his wife. That the two coming together is a sharing. It's a sharing and a oneness. And it's meant to be in a bond that is sacred and holy. A man and his wife bound together by God as one until death separates them. And our culture says, no. Our culture says, you should try out. You should live together. Well, we did some studies about people that live together. You know that when, if they live together, your chances of getting divorced are, are radically higher than if you don't. Well, there's STDs. They're epidemic in America right now, right? But, you know, but people, it doesn't slow people down. We need to practice safe sex. The message for kids is not abstinence because, come on, we got to be serious. We need to teach safe sex and we need to teach it early because they're going to do it anyway. I mean, the culture is going to say what it says, and it sounds an awful lot like Jezebel. Worship idols, have sex with whoever you want, <laughs> as much as you can get away with, especially if you're rich and powerful. Take advantage of them, right? I mean, that's, the, that's our culture. The church is different. The church needs to say, hey, God has a better plan for you. God wants to do something in your life. God has something marvelous. Did the devil rip you off? Well, seek God for for repentance and healing and, and watch God do a work and live holy. See what God will do. In the church, there are both these groups simultaneous. Um, he says, the rest of who are there who don't have this doctrine, and then verse 24, he continues, who've not known the depths of Satan, as they say. You know, there's these deep things of darkness, you know. Boy, you don't know it. You're missing out on something. Listen, you don't need to know the depths of Satan. <laughs> superficial knowledge of Satan is plenty, <laughs> right? Those of you guys who have been ripped off by the devil, do you want to go deeper? I'm not really sure I plumbed the depths of what Satan wants to do with my life. <laughs> no, no, I think a superficial knowledge is pretty good. The thief, Jesus said the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. We know the depths of Satan. He's going to rip you off and he's going to kill you with the idea that he would destroy you completely. That's the depths. He said, I'm not going to put any burden on you Except this, verse 25, hold fast what you have until I come. I think it's a great word of encouragement. Jesus says, hang in there, you guys. Hang in there. Make a stand for righteousness. Deal with th This church is not dealing with the, this false teaching that it doesn't matter how you live. It matters how you live. Absolutely matters. And, and we're supposed to walk in holiness. Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 
He said, this is the will of God for you, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That's the will of God for your life, that you'd be holy, that you'd abstain from sexual immorality. So hang in there, he says. Hold fast what you have until I come. And then there's this wonderful encouragement for those that would overcome. He who overcomes, in verse 26, and keeps my works until the end, I will give power over the nations. And he quotes Psalm 2. He'll rule them with a rod of iron, and they'll be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessel, as I've received from my Father. So the first part of the promise is related to the establishment of the kingdom of Jesus. Remember, it starts off, uh, this message, the, one, the Son of God with eyes like a flame of fire, His feet are like fine brass. The promise is, I'm coming, and I'm establishing a kingdom. So hang in there, because you're at a time when there's a corruption of the kingdom. There's just corruption everywhere. There's a corrupt view of sex. There's a corrupt view of relationships. There's a corrupt view of identity. And you're living and you're trying to live a holy life. Hang in there and keep shining like a light because if you overcome, then I'm coming and you're going to be with me when I establish my kingdom. You know, Jesus is coming to establish his kingdom. Isn't that awesome to think about? It's going to happen. The Mugabis, the Idi Amins, the Adolf Hitlers, the Napoleons, or whoever, whoever has lived and tried to rule that had their short and corrupt and evil reign, and they fell, and they were destroyed, and, and there's just been a recycling of the same wickedness throughout all of history, all around the planet. Jesus is coming again, and we're part of that kingdom. And so Jesus reminds them, listen, do what's right, deal with this that's going on in your fellowship, um, but hang in there, because if you overcome, I'm going to give you a place in my kingdom. And then verse 28, this is another promise, I will give him the morning star. It's an interesting reference. I'm not totally sure I understand exactly what he's referring to. Um, if you think of it in terms of, uh, of a long, dark night, and it's finally over, and, you, and the, the sun is starting to rise, and there's one last star, and this guy's like, this is, the night is past, and the light is coming. And, and it's interesting also, in Revelation 22, Jesus calls himself the bright morning star. So probably a reference to him. You know, you'll be with me, in my kingdom, and, and I'm going to give this to you. He concludes, as he concludes all of the letters, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. I think of these different letters that are written, and we're trying to study them and understand them. I think this one in particular speaks to our generation because we're plagued by an assault against us, uh, enticing us into sexual immorality. And we're plagued. We live in a place that is just filled with temptations towards idolatry. And this idea that there would be a message that would say, it doesn't matter. Just embrace it. Why have everybody mad at you? Why create all this drama? Just embrace it. Please yourself. I mean, we're, you just see that picture and that one story of Ahab saying, I want what I want, and I'm throwing a fit because I can't have what I want. And Jezebel comes along and said, I'll give you what you want. Man, that's a danger for us. This, this warning to this church speaks directly to us. And I think we need to respond to it the same way that, that Isaiah responded in his day to a revelation of God. I want you to turn in, and we'll close with this, with this uh, passage, Isaiah 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah has a revelation of God. Isaiah's, and Isaiah is easy to find. Just find the middle of your Bible, 66 chapters long, so right smack in the middle, pretty much. Or if you're using this Bible, 789. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. So there's your revelation. He sees this vision of God sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. One cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out and the house was filled with smoke. So this revelation of the glory of God and the holiness of God, and look at Isaiah's response, verse 5. I said, woe is me, for I'm undone. Isaiah's response to the revelation of God was, I'm in trouble. If this is the holiness of God, if this is who God is, 
I'm in trouble. <laughs> Why? Because of his own unholiness. I'm undone because, he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. As he's seeing the glory of God and this worship of God in his holiness and seeing God in his holiness, he realizes how unholy he is. And, and I think this relates to us as well, look at the next phrase in verse 5, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I'm messed up and my people are messed up. You know, I'm not holy and I'm in an unholy generation. I'm living in a time of unholiness. I'm living at a time of unprecedented unholiness for my culture and for my people. I'm living at a time where my whole culture wholesale is telling God, we don't want anything to do with you. And I said that my own self. Oh God, I'm in trouble. Now thankfully, Isaiah is not only six chapters long, right? And the next verse says, and God smote him because he was unholy. No, the eyes like a flame of fire the judgment, the, 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 the cleansing that comes. Isaiah has this revelation and he realizes, oh my goodness, I need God. I need to be delivered. And look at verse 6. God has an antidote for his uncleanness. One of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he'd taken, from, taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth. And he said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. You see, God has an answer. God wants to purge us. He wants to cleanse us. But we need to confess. Our response to to this revelation of what God would say to us about our lives is to confess. Those of you that are parents, and you remember when your children were small, you remember watching your child, maybe between three and five years old, three and six years old, struggle with confession. And you can just see them in this battle. You're like, look, did you do it? And you just know. They want to tell the truth, and they're like, no, I didn't. And you can see the agony because they're not hypocrites yet. They can't fake it, and they're trying to fake it. They're trying to learn hypocrisy and and perform at a higher level. And like, no. And you're like, and you can just feel the battle. They're struggling. They're dying. They want to say it. And you're like, come on. And you try all your tactics, good cop, bad cop. You separate them from the other criminals in your house. And okay, you go over there. You talk to your dad and mom and... And you, and you just, just what happened? And you just see the battle. And what happens when that child finally goes, I did it. And what happens? You just need it. Just confess. And then the weight of the world goes off of them. And they cry, I'm so sorry. And, you're like, and you restore them. And you love on them. You go, well, what happened? You talk about it. You deal with it. It's gone. And the rest of the day, they play and have fun till the next criminal activity. You know? And then you have, you're disciplining them, depending upon your kids, you know? But boy, as a pastor, I've seen people struggle to confess. And they look just like that little kid. So what's going on? Nothing. What's happening? I'm fine. And you're like, just let go of it. No. And you're like, just confess. What are you hanging on to? You're like, look at Isaiah. What happened? Isaiah saw it and Isaiah said, oh my goodness, I'm undone. And what did he do? He confessed. He confessed for his people. And what did God do? God provided cleansing. Jesus Christ died on a cross and rose from the dead to provide cleansing for sin. His eyes like a flame of fire are not to be feared. That, flame, that, that awesome judgment of God, we welcome it and say, oh Lord, please come and make my heart your home. Lord, change me. I confess. Would you, would you do that? I think of this church that we're reading about in Revelation 2 has a group in the midst that's actively practicing sexual immorality. They're living in sin. And they're, they're saying, it's okay. They're, worship, they're not committed to Jesus. They're not following him. And they're saying, well, that's fine. Because God just wants me happy. They're listening to the spirit of Jezebel. And, it's in, and they're in the church. And there's another group that's not. And I wonder, is there anybody here this morning? And that's you. You're there. You're carnal. You, you don't listen to God. You, don't, you, you want to say that you're a Christian because you want to tell yourself you're going to go to heaven when you die, but you don't ever do what Jesus says. You're deceiving yourself. Would you be able to awaken like Isaiah did, or hopefully like these guys in our passage, because the last verse we read, if anybody has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Do you, are your ears hearing what the Spirit's saying to you this morning? Let's pray. Father, 
We thank you for your honesty in your word and the straightforwardness of your word. And we thank you, Lord, for setting us free from those things that would imprison us and destroy our lives, Lord. And we know that sexual immorality is a, is a trap and uh, it's a prison. And we thank you, Lord, that you're willing to speak the truth to us and tell us what your intentions are and what the truth is so we could be delivered. And we thank you, Lord, for telling us about idolatry and how to be free from it. And thank you, Jesus, that you're the one person who can set people free. And like Isaiah, who cried out and no one could help him, Lord, but you could. Something from heaven could come and change him and take away his, his, his shame and his guilt. And we thank you, Jesus, that it's your blood that you died on the cross for our sins, that you rose from the dead, and whoever believes in you won't perish but have everlasting life, and that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we pray that you'd speak. If there's anybody here this morning who, who needs to repent, who, who's in a place of, of idolatry and in a place of sexual immorality, that you, this would be their wake-up call, that you would call them out of that, that they would decide, you know what, I'm going to live for the Lord. I'm, I'm not going to keep going on in this path that I'm on. If that's you, I want to give you a chance to respond, and I'm going to ask you to do something maybe a little more public. I want to just ask you to stand up right now. The Lord has been speaking to you about this, and this morning is uh, your wake-up call. I want to ask you to stand. You've you could be specifically sexual immorality. It could be more general, just a lifestyle like Ahab of, of whining and complaining because you want your way and, uh, and thinking that that's what Christianity is. But you're done with it. You're ready to repent. I'm just going to give you a chance to respond. Just stand up where you're at. I want to pray for you. Anybody else want to stand up? If you have ears to hear what the Spirit's saying to the church, then hear it. I'm standing with you. Anybody else? Father, I thank you that just like Isaiah, when he saw you, he realized that he was messed up and he cried out, Lord. And thank you how you were able to touch him from heaven and cleanse him and take away um, that uncleanness, take away that guilt and shame, take away um, its power in his life. And I think of the Apostle Paul, Lord, who's, when he said, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And Lord, these are standing here, Lord, we're standing and we're, we're asking you, Jesus, to cleanse us to transform us, Lord. We pray and ask you uh, to break uh, the power of sin in our lives. We agree with you. We agree, Lord, uh, that we want to live holy lives, that you're holy. Your kingdom is a holy kingdom. And, and we recognize, Lord, the, the voice of Jezebel in our generation and in our culture that would say, this is not that big of a deal. Just do whatever you want. Lord, it's a lie and we reject it and we're praying and asking you, Jesus, to cleanse and transform us and give us the victory. We pray for all, all of us standing, Lord, that you would move in a mighty way in our lives to deliver us and to give us power, Lord, to go forward uh, in holiness and in victory. And Lord, any, any uh, changes that need to be made, Lord, that we would make them th today, uh, any any closing of doors, Lord, that we close them today, that you give us, give us that power, Lord, and that, that victory. We thank you for that, Lord, and we thank you for, for your word to us, and we receive it. 